It was beneath the trees of the grounds belonging to our house, or on the bleak sides of the woodless mountains near, that my true compositions, the airy flights of my imagination, were born and fostered. I did not make myself the heroine of my tales. Life appeared to me too commonplace an affair as regarded myself. I could not figure to myself that romantic woes or wonderful events would ever be my lot. But I was not confined to my own identity, and I could not people the hours with creations far more interesting to me at that age than my own sensations. Here I recount the circumstances which led to the creation of my greatest work, surrounded by my fellow romantics on the shores of Lake Geneva, with luck exactly as they happened. We're calling it the Little Ice Age, you know. Calling what? The unseasonable weather. We're calling it the Little Ice Age. Oh, Percy, they say it's the result of some ghastly eruption in the East Indian archipelago. Isn't that just Gotham? Suffering so immense, the skies themselves seem to close up across the world in mourning. I hear Lord Byron has taken up residence in a summer home on Lake Geneva. Perhaps that's what we need. A holiday away from these melancholic skies. Percy Shelley, you old boy! I see you've brought your latest news. Mary, I'm a writer myself. Yes, you're that Wollstonecroft girl. Your mother wrote that horribly droll manifesto on the rights of a woman, did they not? A vindication of the rights of women. Bang on! And what exactly are they working on now? My mother died giving birth to me. Oh dear. It seems you've brought some of that ghastly, stormy London weather along with you. Come, come, inside. We have much to discuss. Aren't you coming? It proved a wet, ungenial summer, and incessant rain often confined us for days to the house. Some volumes of ghost stories, translated from the German into French, fell into our hands. Each write a ghost story, said Lord Byron. And his proposition was acceded to. There were four of us in the drawing room that night. We pondered as the noble author began to recite the penultimate lines of his poem Mazeppa. Comrades, good night, the hetman threw, his length beneath the oak tree shade, with leafy couch already made. A bed nor comfortless nor new, to him who took his rest when e'er. The hour arrived, no matter where, his eyes hastening slumbers steep. And if ye marvel, Charles forgot to thank his tale. He wondered not. The king had been an hour asleep. I busied myself to think of a story, a story to rival those which had excited us in this task, one which would speak to the mysterious fears of our nature and awaken thrilling horror. Want to make the reader dread to look round, to curdle the blood and quicken the beatings of the heart. Night waned upon this talk, and even the witching hour had gone by before we retired to rest. When I placed my head on my pillow, I did not sleep, nor could I be said to think. Percy and Byron stood outside my chamber door, loudly arguing some philosophical doctrine, and among others, the nature of the principles of life, and whether there was any probability of it ever being discovered and communicated. They talked of the experiments of Dr. Darwin and of the lengths man had gone to steal the sublime from nature. Is it man's homage to emulate the creator? Pish! That's already what we do when we create as artists, as poets, as writers. We also destroy those ghastly machinations in Gladstone, in Leeds, those hideous machines shooting black soot into the sky, corrupting like a cancer. Exactly. Destruction. So don't you think it's time for humanity's next great creation? What exactly are you suggesting? A heart is beating, then it's done. What is the difference? My imagination, unbidden, possessed and guided me, gifting the successive images that arose in my mind with a vividness far beyond the usual bounds of reverie. I saw, with shut eyes but acute mental vision, 
I saw the pale student of unhallowed art kneeling beside that thing he had put together, that creature. I saw the hidden phantasm of a man stretched out and then on the working of some powerful engine show signs of life and stir with an uneasy half vital motion. Frightful must it be, for supremely frightful would be the effect of any human endeavor to mock the stupendous mechanism of the creator of the world. His success would terrify the artist. He would rush away from his odious handiwork, horror-stricken. The idea so possessed my mind as a thrill of fear ran through me, and I wished to exchange the ghastly image of my fancy for the realities around. Swift as light, and as cheering was the idea that broke in upon me, I have found it. What terrified me will terrify others, and I need only describe the specter which had haunted my midnight pillow. On the morrow, I announced that I had thought of a story. I've done it. It was a dreary night in November. And now, once again, I bid my hideous progeny go forth and prosper. I have an affection for it, for it was the offspring of happy days, when death and grief were but words, which found no true echo in my heart on the gloomy shores of Lake Geneva.